broadcasting live to the UK. UK. News, information, entertainment, and the best music from the past 40 years. This is Play 2 UK. Tommy Boyd. Call 01243 55 60 60. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Skype play.radio.uk. Now, live from the south coast of England, The Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. Good evening. Yes, you are listening to Play Radio UK and this is Play 2. This is The Tommy Boyd Show, although as you've probably gathered, Tommy's not here at the moment. He's left me in charge. Um, it is three minutes past ten if you're listening live in the UK tonight. If you've been listening to the last couple of hours, we've had just had the fantastic Steve Paul. Um, didn't he do a brilliant job? Um, and, of course, he was joined by Alison Mead. And they were chewing over some interesting subjects tonight. So... Um, when Tommy joins me shortly, I think we will probably pick up the baton and carry on with some of those subjects. Um, what were they talking about? They were talking about increasing the driving age from 17 to somewhere around 21. Actually, I think 25. I think that you need to be at least 25 to get a driving license what do you think oh one two four three fifty five sixty sixty you can email us at studio at playradiouk.com you can also skype us at play.radiouk so i want to know what you think and my name's fiona so what do you think increasing the driving age to 25 and i'd go one further than that Let's have let's remove their driving licenses at the age of 65. Why not? That's what I think. What do you think? Um, some of the other subjects that they were talking about tonight was internet dating. Have you ever dated on the internet? You know, I've got some friends that are, um, you know, in their 40s and out of a first marriage and looking to find Mr. Right again and... You know, where where do you go now to find Mr. Right when you're in that situation, in the in your 40s? Um, so have you ever tried dating on the internet? That's what I want to know. 01243 55 60 60. Good evening, Mr. Boyd. You Good join- evening. Are you joining me? I'd like to hear this again. <laughs> I wanted to play with these buttons. Big hello to Connie Lingus, who's 69 on Tuesday. She'll be enjoying my meat and two veg on Sunday at 12, which are all the very best, and tell her I look forward to seeing her when she comes. Thanks ever so much, says Ivan Ardon. And he says, uh, please say hello to Bill as well. And that comes from Ivan uh, going out to uh, Connie in Thurnby Lodge here in Leicestershire. Good evening, it's Tommy Boyd and Fiona with you until Uh 10 o'clock. It's five past ten UK time if you're listening live on your PC or your laptop. How are you this evening? Bear in mind what Steve was saying. Um, It'd be nice to get your thoughts at some point if you want to peck something into your keyboard by way of an email or maybe you fancy a word, in which case if you're feeling retro, you can go 01243556060, the switchboard number, which I think is on our website believe somewhere the studio number um or of course you can skype play.radio.uk uh just before uh stephen labadee has skyped to say are the webcams up yet we've got a static webcam but we're working on moving webcams which we had on a sunday night here oh about four or five months ago and then we decided to upgrade them and that's taken a little while I've got one thing for you this evening. First of all, I enjoyed Steve's show enormously. He's quite a geezer, isn't he? He's good, isn't he? And Ali as well. Mm. Yeah, great fun, great fun. His remark about um, being honest uh, uh, and saying that you're lovely, Fiona, (laughs) and that that, that line about, um, you know, you look like a moose but you're making a nice (laughs) cup of tea made me laugh, and I don't know why. It It was just such a... Uh, it tripped off the tongue so well. It was there was something almost <laughs> like he was being very truthful. <laughs> well, no, but it was just such a nice remark. It was so beautifully weighted, <laughs> um, and I, I just it was it had sort of the the rhythm of a Shelley poem about it, except <laughs> except it was from the streets of Peckham. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was beautiful. Great fun. Well done, Steve and Ali. More of them 8 or 10 on Tuesdays on Play Talk UK. Uh, Andy's headache tonight is a very interesting one. Andy said to me today in the car park, if cars had bigger wheels, would they use less petrol? And indeed, would the speedometer be wrong? He said, and the reason he asked that is because as cars' tyres wear down, so the diameter of the wheel <laughs> is reduced, only okay. by a fraction. Yeah. But on a journey of 500 miles, it's quite significant. If you're running on thin tyres, your tyres, your wheels, are doing less distance every time they rotate. Yeah. It's only marginal, but it mounts up over 500 miles. So he wondered whether... If there's any truth in the possibility, if there's any fact in the possibility that bigger wheels mean that the car would go further on a gallon of petrol, okay, mm. but that also your speedometer would be inaccurate because the speedometer is presumably linked to the rotation of the wheel. Okay. Isn't it? Is it? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. But if it is, you see, then... If you've got thick tyres, brand new ones, okay, <laughs> all right, you've got bigger wheels, so your car is actually going faster than your speedometer suggests it is, mm. and if you've got thin tyres on the same car, your car is going slower than mm. your speedometer says it is. So if you had really, really fat tyres, mm -hmm. okay, like an inch and a half thicker than they should be, yeah, okay, you could be doing... You could be doing 80 miles an hour, but your speedometer only says 70. Mm. Are you with this? <laughs> Are yes, you? Yes, I am. No, I am. But that's the, Andy's headache, and it's a huge one. So I was stood in the car park, you see, and I was talking to Andy about this, and I said, Andy, what's your headache today? Oh, he said, I've got this real headache about tyres, because he went on a drive to Northamptonshire right. and back mm -hmm. uh, last week, and it was in his mind all the time. Okay. And... He said, but surely nobody else is interested in that sort of thing. And I said, I think you'll find a lot of men are, because <laughs> it's the sort of shit that men talk. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so then down came Matt, mm -hmm. and who else was in the conversation? Jamie came in. And now we've got four men who all know each other, because they all work in the same play radio office. All talking shit. And all talking <laughs> shit about whether or not fat tyres, <laughs> right, would be... And somebody said, well, if you've got a tractor-sized tyre, mm -hmm. okay, one revolution of that tyre, mm. which, which would be caused by the same number of internal sparks in the combustion engine, mm -hmm. a tractor tyre is, what's, what's the circumference of a tractor tyre? No, oh, I it's don't about know. 15 feet, isn't okay. it? It's about six feet high. So mm -hmm. pi equals two. Anyway, <laughs> he said, if you had tractor tyres mm -hmm. on your on your Mondeo, yes. okay, your car would probably go three times as far on the gallon of petrol. Yes. You see that? Yeah, I think that kind of makes sense, yeah. Then a couple of other guys joined, <laughs> whose names I don't know, who work downstairs, <laughs> right? And they were standing, sort of earwigging the conversation. <laughs> so I said to them, Oi, boys, what do you think? And they came in straight away. And the first guy, a big tall guy with a beard, he went, funnily enough, he said, I googled that not long ago. <laughs> no. So this is Andy's headache for today, and it is absolutely huge. And I would really like to know if anybody can cast any intelligence whatsoever on this man shit. <laughs> which is what we discuss. And actually, Andy's got two headaches at the moment, because that wasn't the first one. Mm. The first one that he came up with was, if... The equator is that much hotter than the North Pole just because it's a few thousand miles further away from the sun, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Considering that the sun is 92 million miles away mm. and you've got that enormous variation in temperature yes, over a very short distance, yes, right? Mm -hmm. Then how critical is it? that we stay exactly the same number of feet away from the sun. Yeah. Because if we were to move two or three thousand miles nearer the sun... Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. We uh, could all melt. We, we would all melt. <laughs> yeah. Because the temperature at the equator would be the same as the temp... Uh, the temperature of the North Pole, he said, would surely be the same as the temperature is at the equator now. Yeah. And, and a couple of thousand miles in the universe is nothing. 
Mm. I mean, what is the percentage of 92 million? What what percentage is 2,000 of 92 million? Right. It's a gnat. Yeah. It's a gnat. Mm -hmm. So that's his other headache. So that's a good one if you're uh, at your PC, if you want to Google or come up with anything or talk any man shit. <laughs> <laughs> there was something just on the subject of the um, speedome speedometer. Um, when uh, on a journey recently that I did um, using my sat nav, I noticed that because that um, tells you what speed you're going at yes. as well and tells you if you're speeding and right. what have you. Um, and I noticed that that differed quite significantly from the speedometer in my car. There you are. There you are. I'm not sure if we have a Skype call. Who's this? Hello? Oh. No. Problem with remote sound device. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, whoever was Skyping on Sky something or other, there's a slight problem with your device. I hope it was on the Andy headache thing. So what's the difference then between your sat nav speed indicator and your speedometer? Are you consistently being told by your sat nav that you're going faster than your speedo says? Uh, or does it vary? Uh, no, I was kind of, what was I doing? I was sort of sticking to my sat nav speed um, because it was quite useful because it starts shouting at me if I start going over the speed limit so if i'm in a 40 zone and i start doing 42 it'll scream at me so i know to slow down and it just you know whereas as soon as i fall into a 70 speed limit you know that sort of thing so um i was sort of using the sat nav um but it's the it was actually telling me i was going slower than i actually was so it was the, the new speedometer said yes i'm just going to leave the phone lines open tonight okay so if you call, you'll just be on. All right. Oh, so just so join no in. So then. I don't think you need one, do you? <laughs> as soon Me? As, are you? Yeah, you're on. Oh, lovely. So you know. Oh. First of all, Sorry, do you have any idea about the tire? Uh, yeah, this is what I'm calling about. Okay, excellent. Come on then. Right. On on this headache nonsense, right? Yes. It it relates to something else, right? So this this will prove your point, yeah. Okay. This will prove that the bigger tire. Yeah. Uh, whatever you said, in. In the, would have been the early 80s, there were two sizes of golf ball. 162 for England and 168 for America. You weren't allowed to play a 162 ball in an American tournament, but you were allowed to play a 168 ball in a British tournament along with a 162. Okay. The 162 being the smaller ball yes. flew further. Right. It's now standardised at 168. You can't buy 162s anymore. Therefore, yeah. the bigger ball flies less. Therefore, it takes more effort to move the no, bigger ball. No, uh, I'm sorry. This You're not really helping here because your golf ball thing is all about wind resistance. No. Yes? But in theory, it's the same thing. You're saying it take, it's more effort. No, I'm not to... talking about wind resistance. I'm, I'm just saying that if... How, how many... How many little uh, sparks in an internal combustion engine does it take to make the piston go round all the way to make a, a you know a circular motion? Well, see again now going back onto it depends on the load on the engine and also the uh, wind resistance can affect it. So if you've got a bigger tire, yes. you've got fractionally more wind resistance. It's not and about wind resistance. Just stay there while I read an email from David, who says you're absolutely correct about tire wear. And what's David's qualifications? <laughs> He's an intelligent man. He says, this is why you're... What are his credentials? He'll no doubt f fax them to me, if anybody faxes <laughs> these days. This is why you're entitled, he goes on. I'll give you 30 quid for that fax you've got in the attic. Do you want it for 30 quid? Yeah, I, I could do with a fax. What do you want a fax for? I will still need to send faxes occasionally. I'll, I'll, I'll sell you my fax machine for 30 quid. Good. Do you, want anything you else? Down... Do you want anything else I've got up there? No, just a fax machine, because you mentioned that the other week, and it's... I thought, oh, I could need a fax machine, but I don't fancy well, spending a hundred quid for it. Would well. you like to know the only fax that it's sent? Go on. The I've only fax? broken fa a fork. A metal one? Well, half of it's metal, the other end of it is bubbles in glass. How far do you live from Hertfordshire? That's where Yuri Geller has a mansion. Not far. There you are. His magic is still there. <laughs> He's still got it. So what we're saying, right? Yes. Is that the extra resistance 
on the if you've got a bigger tire, yes, right, you've got a heavier wheel and a heavier axle, yes, and a heavier push rod or camshaft. Or now I'm lost. Yeah, you are. Yeah, but the the bits of metal that connect the wheel to the road to the engine are bigger. Yeah, therefore it takes more effort to move a bigger tire. Yeah, than it does. To move a smaller one. I appreciate one. And the that, same that, way, I, I that pre- bigger I, golf ball doesn't fly as small as a smaller no, golf ball. No, there is a separate thing. Come back to that. I appreciate that there will be additional resistance if you had a bigger tyre. And that there will be a weight factor. Oh, fuck. Fuck yeah. yourself. <laughs> Sorry, I've just had with some carrot cake and with the fork episode, it's gone everywhere. <laughs> well, you are a, you a, one you of these what? men this who is, eat cake with a fork? This is Tesco's carrot cake, right? It hasn't seen a bit of carrot anywhere in this. It's like chemical carrot. Yeah. I don't think no. you'll find there's supposed to be any carrot in carrot cake. It's No? I don't think so. Well, why is it called carrot cake? If you go to a fete on a Same Sunday, re- yes. <laughs> there's there's old women selling bits of carrot cake in, in cling film, isn't yes, there? Yes, the, invariably. For 35p. Yes. It does and have carrot And some of them are quite it? nice. Yeah, but there doesn't have to be carrot in cake. In, in, cakes don't have to have in them what they say in the name. Otherwise, okay... What kind of a person eats an angel cake? <laughs> What's the, okay. There's no such thing as an angel cake. A very bad person. There are angel cakes. You can get angel cakes. Fairy ca- fairy cakes. Who I knew you- a girl called angel cakes once. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, I wish I did. You're pulling the conversation away from the, 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 the almost intense level of ignorance that you've brought to this conversation. <laughs> so, how typically man of you. Well done. Good manship. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I make a valid point. You don't. I did, and it's a point that you hadn't thought of. In the debate so far. Are you having uh, a cup of tea with your carrot cake? No. All right. Talk to you Bye later. Out. Thank Milk. you, uh, Jason. Lovely talking to you. <laughs> ah, that's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's regroup. I must read David's yes. email on this subject. He says, you're absolutely correct about tyre wear. This question, Andy's headache began... Because as he was driving all the way from Northampton, I think it was, down back to the south coast, it occurred to him that his tyres were wearing thinner as he went along. And he therefore worked out that it was taking more revolutions of the car tyre, okay, uh, to actually travel the same distance that he travelled on the way up when the tyres were fatter. Mm -hmm. So he wondered how significant that was in terms of petrol consumption. Yeah. And also whether it would affect the speedometer reading of his vehicle. And I think it's a terrific, terrific headache. David Mm -hmm. continues on this. You're absolutely correct about tyre wear. This is why you're entitled to 10% above the speed limit by law to allow for tyre tyre wear. Really? I think you are. But I don't know if it's written down anywhere. You'll rarely get done for doing 32 in a 30 zone. Mm. Or 43 in a 40 zone. Okay. I have not met... I've... I've said this to somebody and they've gone, oh, yes, I was done for doing 51 and 50 mile an hour. But I don't believe them. Because <laughs> <laughs> people will, men, as you know, will talk yes. shit. Yes. And so, but David's email. Uh, this is why you're entitled 10% above the speed limit by law to allow for tyre wear. Mm. Your pedometer will never be, your speedometer will never be, I know, he spelt <laughs> it peometer. <laughs> Are you all right, David? You're on the wine again. Your pedometer <laughs> will never be accurate because a tyre wear and the diameter changes. If you put a large wheel, if you put a larger wheel, if we forget that they may not fit, you would go faster, but unfortunately your gears would no longer be adequate for the car. It's very likely in first gear you would not longer be able to drive the car away. And by the way, he adds, the sat nav gives you your accurate speed. Really? That's what he says, and he's differed, a bloke. It differed quite significantly. How much? Mm, six miles per hour. Bloody hell! Yeah. yeah One of the absolutely. best radio stunts that I've heard of was done in America. A radio station said, if you like to turn up at such and such a shopping mall on a Saturday morning, mm-hmm. okay, the local police will be there with the speed gun. Right. And you can drive past them and compare <laughs> what your speed... Op- no, it's on a car park. Okay. You can drive past them at what you think is 30 miles an hour. Yeah. And they will compare your speedometer's 30 miles an hour with their reading on their speed gun. Right. And the queue stretched into the next tri-state. Really? I don't know what a tri-state is. No. But no. a long way. <laughs> Man shit again. I get you just. Yeah. Um, 
and I'd have, I'd have pitched up if I had the chance because you want to know, don't you, how accurate your speedo is? Yeah, especially when there's a speed cam thing. But it was quite scary because, as I say, I was sort of getting a little bit lazy looking at my speedometer because I was having to follow the sat nav anyway, um, and it's just kind of more convenient because it's there than having yeah. to sort of look down all the time. Um, and as I say, it, it made sure you know it would shout at me if I wasn't sticking to the speed limit. So it did kind of make you know. So I was not looking at my speedometer and then when i looked down i thought oh my god <laughs> i've been traveling for quite some time yeah. over the speed limit it, it won't be yeah well um, we'll talk about sat nav again in just a second but andy's headaches this evening fantastic um if your car's tires have w are wearing thin are you traveling less far for your petrol because a revolution of the tyre is not taking you quite as far as it did when your tyres were new and therefore fatter. is a really good headache. His other headache is a bit daft, so we'll come back to that another time. But this is working very well. Email from Louise, which we'll get to very shortly on this one. If, if it's the Louise I'm thinking of, uh, she's a taxi driver or connected with motoring anyway. So she probably knows her onions on this one. It's uh, Play Talk UK. It's Tommy Boyd. Uh, here from 10 o'clock until 12 o'clock this Tuesday evening. I had a couple of emails from people saying, is, is, is this some kind of permanent change? Are we getting two hours less of Boyd? N sort of no in the, in the medium term, uh, because uh, Playtalk UK is shaping up to um, extend the schedules in lots of different directions, and so we're just um, getting to know a few new voices and people that uh, we hope you listening are going to like. Uh, if you get a moment, I'd like to hear that, or all about that, uh, mm. as an email. If you're podcasting uh, and you uh, heard the first two hours this evening, 8 till 10, love to hear your views. It's studio at playradiouk.com. Weather? Play to UK. Weather. Clear and chilly over England and Wales with light winds and some air frost, especially in the south. Cloud in the north will spread south overnight, bringing milder conditions generally, but also some outbreaks of light rain over western areas. Looking on to tomorrow, largely dry with occasional bright spells over southern and eastern parts of the UK. Cloudy with outbreaks of light rain and drizzle elsewhere. Mild in the north, but rather windy. You're up to date on Play 2 UK. Something. Something is in your area now and ready to change the way you pay for your phone and broadband. Choose from our range of phone and broadband packages from just $14.99 a month, including line rental, inclusive evening and weekend calls to landlines, and up to two meg broadband, all for one credit crunch beating monthly fee. Add to this something's fantastic range of TV and radio packages, you really have got something for everyone. Find out more by calling 0871 664 15 or go to www.something.info. PlayRadioUK.com is dedicated to providing you with a fully interactive website and music service. Choose from 13 stations playing all kinds of music 24 hours a day. Find answers to your technical questions. Podcast your favourite shows. Download content to your mobile phone. Interact with other users in our forum. Buy music from your favourite artists and find out who's on when and what we're up to. PlayRadioUK.com. Internet radio your way. Websites don't always work to their full potential. In fact, they can seem like a mystic art. Wouldn't it be great if you had someone on hand to wave a magic wand that would optimize, improve, and increase traffic to your website? Fear no more. The Web Wizard is here dispensing web wisdom and free tips. Email your question to Jason Rutland, the Play 2 Web Wizard, wizard at playradiouk.com. Then listen at 2.30pm on the last Thursday of every month. The Web Wizard on Play 2 with Argo Internet Business Consultants. Growing your ideas. Click argo.uk.com. The Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. So, although we have a, a raft, of issues that we want to develop between now and 12 o'clock uh, and of course we're always open to ideas from folk uh, who find themselves stuck at their PC or laptop this evening good evening no doubt you've minimized the sound and so you're roaming yourself around your PC uh, because you can't actually sit and listen I don't think just to the page that you get from play radio when you log on to listen so when I listen at home 
I uh, minimise the sound thing and then go for a little walk, mm -hmm. go Googling and stuff. Yeah. Um, sometimes I get knocked off if I go to a big, rich sound, a, a, a site with a rich uh, audio stream. Mm -hmm. Then there's obviously a bit of a bit of argy bargy between whoever I'm listening to and that. Mm. But generally speaking, if you're able to Google and stuff, we've got um, a headache. Andy's headache this evening, which is to do with the fact that if we had bigger wheels on our cars, will we get more miles per gallon? And I think there's something in it that has to be. And the other one is, is the variation in temperature between the equator and the poles only a matter of them being something like 5,000 miles at the poles further away from the sun than the equator? Yes. And, uh... I believe, is it Oscar? It is. Who has Skyped uh, a message on this. If you are listening and you haven't got Skype yet, um, I re strongly recommend that you get it uh, because you can not only talk to us uh, studio quality and it doesn't cost you anything using Skype. All you need is one of those little headsets with a little sort of Madonna microphone, 999, I think, PC World. But also you can just uh, tap in a chat thing. Yeah, as long as you know our Skype address, play.radio.uk. So Oscar has uh, tapped in a Skype message and it says, silly person, this is in relation to Andy's headache about, about the Earth and our distance from the Sun. He says, silly person, it is not the closeness to the Sun which makes the equator hotter. It is the heat caused by the friction of the rotation of the Earth which is obviously moving fastest at the equator and not moving at all at the poles. Oh. If Oscar is right, then I have learned something. Yeah. I I think he's not right. Do you think? I think he's wrong. Okay. I don't think that's the reason. The friction caused by the uh, air. Well, you see, Oscar, what what what's the air rubbing against in order to create the friction? Because there's nothing in space to create heat through friction. Something has to rub against something else. And if it's the air at the top of the atmosphere on the equator that's moving faster than the air at the top of the North Pole, it's not got anything to rub against because space is a, and I always say vacuum, but I believe the correct pronunciation is vacuum. But the Earth is spinning, isn't it? What do you say? Yes, the Earth is spinning. Vacuum. I know, I say vacuum, but I understand the correct pronunciation is vacuum. Really? Yes. Is that but like who goes round saying, whose turn is it to vacuum this <laughs> morning? <laughs> what do you call it? Vacuum. You call it the vacuum? Yes. Yeah. My wife still says, I'm just going to hoover. Which I think is a generation thing. Hmm. I don't know, actually. It's not a big thing, but I think Oscar's wrong. Mm. I don't like to say wrong, but I, I will. Yeah. Yes. Well, what, what do you, have, have, uh, uh, have you got any wisdom on this one? They're concerns, they're not engineering concerns. Not I, I'm going to ask you about that uh, big thumbs thing. I mean, that is weird. I've had that. It's no, like it's getting, like a, a dream an or a, an altered an altered state when you uh, when you dream. just when you're waking up or before you wake up. Oh, it's loathsome. It is. It's a loathsome feeling. Yes, and your dreams are loathsome. <laughs> 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 Dreams are natural things, and they shouldn't be uh, discussed. In but but he's, the, he's the first bloke yeah, who's, who's who's said that he uh, he had it, and he reminded me that I had it. Who did? Tommy Oscar. Boyd. I thought he was a I had seven league boots. Nothing I ever saw. But I don't bother them. Of, uh, that, that striding, you just like, yeah, stride, 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 getting away, it's, striding it's, it's, as well. It's, it's, yeah. Starts up, legging it as fast as you can, but yeah, even when you can run, you get out of breath. And then at some end, there's a little, there's like almost a switch, a walk, silicon walk switch inside. So. Yeah, and you can lift <laughs> off, but it takes strain in a dream. You know when you got a strain. I know things of dream, that of that ilk. Every muscle is set. I woke up the other morning and the first. My lips were peeled back, so I, must, I knew I must have been having a rave. But uh, I wasn't that bothered, you know that way. It's a dream. Can't bother me. Can't, can't exercise. Oh. Nice one, guys. Thank you. Talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs>
I like. I really like that. One of the strands I want to develop, we call them strands, mm -hmm. we broadcasters. Uh -huh. Now, one of the things I really like is, years ago on Talk Sport, I did this thing which was crap, called the Human Zoo. I say it was crap. Most of it was dross. Mm -hmm. Open the lines, you just pick a line at random, and off they go. Yeah. And for f you could go 45 minutes, and it would be drivel. <laughs> Nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'd get a little nugget, and it was somehow different you know, poignant or human or something. Yeah. Uh, the art of the show actually was that me and the guy who was the tech op called Ash Gould, the legend, yeah. hippie guy, uh -huh. we would discuss the calls. So we'd let three or four calls go through yeah. and then I'd just switch the switchboard down. I'd go, what do you think of that lot then, Ash? And he'd go, uh, not a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go, no. Uh, so that guy with the bagpipes, he was all right. Yeah, he was all right. So that was all right, but... Uh, and lots of people think it was magnificent. That's only because it got canned. I canned it. I got fed up with it <laughs> in the end. Um, but I've always been thinking, what could we do that would be even better than that? Mm -hmm. So one thought I've had, right, is that we go totally, not, not just letting people, not just telling to people you can come on and do what you, you know, you can have a moment. Yeah. Right. But I wondered about, because we've got quite a few listeners who are sort of semi-literate in broadcasting a bit like me <laughs> okay <laughs> so i wondered about say one night once a week for an hour come in here right and say nothing okay and when the phone line rings or yeah. the skype thing goes off yeah just open it up yeah and they're on and let them do and they it. do what they want okay until somebody else knocks yeah. them off yeah Okay. Take a lot of nerve. No, not a lot of nerve, but it would um, it would take time to get going. And it would be quite interesting to see how long the silence <laughs> was at the beginning. <laughs> All right? So what we do is we get, we're at 10 o'clock. Say we did it at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock to 11, so. Yeah. Or 10, half nine till half ten. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, going into com commercial break. On the end of the commercial break, it's over to anybody who wants to host the show. <laughs> yeah. All right? Uh -huh. Because after commercial break, there's nothing. <laughs> be great. <laughs> Why not? There's not enough nothing on the radio. Yeah. Nothing, as Jerry um, Seinfeld, wasn't it, said. Nothing is fantastic. There's not oh, enough it's nothing. So, it's so Everything has to be to something, get. doesn't it? Yeah. Everything has to be something. You listen to so many radio programmes and everybody's got a packed programme <laughs> and here's the menu and here's the guests and here's the experts coming in and then an update on the quiz and all that shite. Yeah. But nothing is good. Yeah. Let's just do a moment of nothing, shall we? Yeah. Can you whistle? It's good for a woman. Not many women can whistle. And that's true. I'm, that's not sexist. <laughs> I think it is. It isn't. Not, you don't hear many women whistling, do you? And people can't whistle as well as they used to. And the reason for that is because we're slovenly in our speech. Right. In order to be able to whistle, you have to have quite mandible lips. <laughs> you see? Okay. I mean, can you whistle a tune? No. <laughs> no but I, I can. Oh, but you've got chapped lips, haven't you? So that's a bit of a. No, they're quite well lubricated tonight. Okay. Come on then. Give us a tune. <laughs> this is very nothingy. Like... Okay. Happy Tree Centre Skype. <laughs> <laughs> that's awful. Yes, it, it does. <laughs> I've got a cold. <laughs> it sounds like a deer farting in the wind, frankly. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> apparently Maybe deers... that's what I was aiming at. Well, apparently deer farts are quite musical, I was reading. Really? Yes. Not all animals fart like we do. Speak you know. for yourself. But a deer, deer apparently... Because <laughs> <laughs> they've got very tiny rectum. <laughs> and yet they eat an awful lot of foliage... <laughs> So they're quite bloated, even though they can. Oh my look, goodness! Yeah. Well, I wouldn't want to be a deer, would you? Uh, not but apparently really. they're, they're fine. <laughs> right? And you sounded like that. Thank you. Okay. But you can't whistle a tune. I was whistling a tune. <laughs> That's better, isn't it? No. It is. Oh, <laughs> look, forget it. Um, happy tree emails. Let, no, let me read uh, Louise Green's tire sizes email. And his headache this evening is whether cars would go. Um, further per gallon if the wheels were bigger. Okay, simple as that. 
And Louise says, hi Tommy and Fiona, speedometers have been about for just over a hundred years. This is the other thing, would it affect your speedometer if you had fat tyres on your car? Yeah. She says, tyre size and tyre wear makes a fairly big difference to the correct working of the speedometer. This can cause around 7% discrepancy. Referring back to speedometers, in a number of countries an allowance for error of 10% mm. is built in. In Britain, where s so really 78 miles an hour then on a motorway is yes. borderline. 77. Yeah. Is legal. But they'll never tell you that. No. Referring back to speedometers, in a number of countries an allowance for an error of 10% is built in. In Britain, where speeding tickets are mostly revenue driven, the error allowance can be as low as 3%. And Alison has emailed, that Steve Paul was okay. I really enjoyed listening to him. Could you not have the whole of Play 2 as a talk station instead of music? That would be brilliant. Well, Play 2's pretty brilliant as it stands. But the Play Talk strands are also quite popular, so who knows, Alison? Who knows? He said darkly, sort of hinting. Teasing. Oh one two four three fifty five sixty. Hello. Si sixty. Well, you've just been on Skype, and now you're on the. Come on, on yes, but I didn't make my points. I've got a point to make in the tidy mate. Do you want to hear it or not? No. <laughs> there, that stole you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was honest. <laughs> um. Mm. Uh, that and is honesty thing. No, and Louise, uh, another email. She says, if Play Radio are expanding their talk schedule and taking on new presenters, I hope they'll find a place for Charlie Wolf and Howard Hughes. Thanks for that, Louise. They would definitely both be an asset in my opinion. Are you able to let us know the amount of increase in talk hours? Thanks, Louise. Not at the moment, uh, but thank you very much indeed, Louise, for the inquiry. Happy Tree uh, Skypes. I never thought about using this for text. That's This is the Skype facility, which is um, terrific. Hmm. It's instant. Is it better than email? Uh, it is in that you can have a dialogue. Yes. Well, I can still have a dialogue what happens anyway, is, but it is more instant. If somebody Skypes you, yes. and we decide, a chat thing, yes. and we decide we're going to go with it, yes. you can actually have a text dialogue with the person. Yeah. Okay. So this, is that you then who said something back to Happy Tree? No. No, he's having a happy, oh. Hmm. No, you can read it all. Okay. So happy I think Tree. he's trying to give me a listen on, a lesson on whistling into the microphone. Uh, yes. <laughs> he's, yes, Happy Tree says aim past the microphone so you don't get that rushing sound. Do you have another go at whistling in just a second, Fiona? <laughs> but Happy Tree says, um, I've looked online for the answer to the equator thing, not for very long. And it generally talks about daylight hours and the directness of the sunlight. There are also factors of land mass heating up and retaining heat. I didn't see this idea specifically, but I would think that the angle at which the sunlight hits the atmosphere and the amount of atmosphere it has to pass through are factors as well. This is Andy's headache whereby he was wondering whether the difference in temperature between the equator and the poles is merely... A matter of the fact that they are two or three thousand miles, five thousand miles, further away from the sun. The poles are further away from the sun than the equator. And there has to be something more to it than that. But it's why it's one of Andy's headaches tonight. Happy Tree says, the more acute the angle of incidence of the thermal energy on the atmosphere, the more atmosphere there, there is to pass through. This causes the colours of the sun to change at sunrise and sunset, for example. I wonder if that also has an effect on the heat transferred. Oh dear, I typo more on Skype than on email, oh well. Yes, that's the thing, you can't really do a spelling check, can you, on Skype? No. Can you? Um... Is that... That means I don't know. No, okay. I'm sure you can. All right. So, let's try wh whistling one last time with you, Fiona, <laughs> just slightly off the microphone. Give us a tune and we'll guess what it is. We? Oh, uh, me and the listener. Oh, well, I'll do... Uh, really? Yes. Okay, uh... You just don't hear women whistling. I'm trying to think of something. I whistle in cues and I know that the person in front of me wants to turn round and see who's whistling, but they never do. 
Okay. Yeah, that's easy. That's very good. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> but it's not a very good whistle. I mean, it's a tune that well, everyone knows. Because it's, just, it's quite low. <laughs> yes. It's like singing, isn't it? Mm. You can't, you have to get right down there. Yeah, it's very good. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, okay. Good evening, caller. Can you whistle? You can't. Well, that wasn't bad. That wasn't. That wasn't bad. Wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> no, it wasn't bad. It's very retro, isn't it? Whistling. It is. Yeah, it's supposed to. In a theatre, it's supposed to be bad luck to whistle. You're right. It is. You're Why right. is that then? I don't know. It's to do with Hamlet or something, or like, the unspoken one, or something like that. I think um, if you well, go on, you obviously <laughs> called with purpose. Bloody hell, that's the cat. Um, the sun and the equator. Yes. It's the angle. It's the, there's several factors that do it. Yeah. Okay. The angle. The angle. Of, well, first of all, on the equator, because the Earth is tilted, you've got uh, short in. You've got in winter. You've got shorter days. Shorter days, right? So it's dark all the time. You don't have any sun at all. Therefore, you get ice that forms. Yeah. This, the this, sun this, comes yes. in at an angle at a much, uh, doesn't come in direct, hits the earth at a much um, sharper angle and bounces off the ice which has been formed in winter and refract, re, 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 bounces off and retracts. Because it's cold, you get less water vapor there. And You sound, if I may say so, you sound as if you almost know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> Well, almost know what you're talking about. I almost know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to man shit. Because <laughs> this is what we do, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How but big is the tilt then? Because somebody in the car park, when Andy mentioned this, his uh, second headache of the. I'm, I may be talking absolute crap, but I think it's six, six degrees. I'm not. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I can't so, remember. So the Earth is spinning around the Sun, as it were, in a horizontal orbit. Yeah, but yeah, but it's but it's but we're on a tilt. We're on a tilt, which actually shifted when the it shifted slightly when the tsunami, the earthquake, has caused that massacre on the, the tsunami. I haven't heard that. It wow, did, it, really? it did actually. That uh, shifted the axis of the earth. Uh, are like you it, sure about this? This isn't man shit. Uh, no, that is absolutely. Uh, some people said it came back, but no, it was big enough to to move it off its axis. Yes. You see, when I was a boy, yeah. I was told by somebody in the playground that if all the Chinese got onto tables <laughs> and jumped off at the same time, the Earth would shift in its orbit. Did you hear that in the playground? Uh, there's, there's all sorts of theories, yeah. Um, there's all sorts of theories like that. that uh, you need to check on it. How would you do that? I don't know. I don't know. It's how heavy? Like, how heavy are the Chinese? There's 1.3 billion of them. Yeah. Right. How, what? Uh, let's assume they all weigh about what should we say? Ten stone, average Chinese. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, probably the Chinese. Yeah, probably ten, no, probably less than that. The Chinese. Probably. Well, so we can work out how many tons of Chinese people there are, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell! Well, no, I can only do it like this because I'm old enough to remember hundred weight. Do you know how heavy a hundred weight is? No, because I was brought up on the continent, so I have to do it in kilos. You know. Oh, yeah. we're not going to. Where's going to take? That's yeah. going to take twice as twice as much man shit to work out in kilos. Do, do you not have tons? Do you not have tons in the continent? Tons are fantastic. Yeah, tons. So, so wait, there's the one billion. How many? One point three billion. You said, all right, yeah. you work out how many, how much all the Chinese people in the world weigh in metric. All right, and uh, what's your name again? It's David. David, you work out how many Chinese people, how much the Chinese people weigh in metric. And I'll do it in Imperial, and we'll see whether it tallies. How's that? Yeah, just one second, yeah. So uh, have, are you using a calculator? Uh, yeah, I'm cheating on that one, yeah. Well, no, that's all right. It's, it's not, it's not maths GCSE here. Uh, Janet, uh, you I'm pad. You whistle, you whistle whilst... It. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, well, the listener can have a go at this as well. If you're listening, at your PC, quick. 
How, how, what is the weight of all the Chinese people? I would say it's divided by two. Right, do it in your head, will you? Because Fiona's going to whistle whilst we're doing it. Okay. <laughs> no, not you, David. <laughs> Fiona, you're working out how much the Chinese weigh in metric. <laughs> That's racist. <laughs> whilst we're doing the Chinese. <laughs> that is racist to bring up the war. <laughs> I was whistling. You, you were bringing up the whole Burma Railway <laughs> issue. <laughs> That's racist. I was That's whistling. Really, yeah, but not Colonel Bogey. <laughs> Unless you do the words. Do you know the words? No, I'm do whistling. Do you know the words, David, to Colonel Bogey? Probably, uh, I know, probably in French. Hello, le soleil brille, 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 something like that. Yeah, okay, well, Fiona, you whistle, and David, you sing the French version I of can't Colonel really Bogey. Well sing, not, not live on air. Uh, yeah, you, you try, you try it for you. Yeah, but yeah. if in French, you'll just sound like Brel. What, Jacques Brel? <laughs> yeah, you'll just sound he like Brel. He wasn't French, he was Belgian. He was Belgian, but everyone thinks he was French. Maybe he wasn't. He All was right, Belgian. then we'll go up an octave and sound like Plaf. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. David, as Plaf, will sing Colonel Bogey in French, accompanied by Fiona on the deer's fart. Go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, tu reviendras, Johnny, là-bas, dans le village. I can't remember the words. Were, were those really the words to Colonel <laughs> Bogey in French? Yes, it is, yeah. Is it a well known song in France? Yeah, le, le Pont de la Rivière Quoi, yeah, of course. The Pont de la Rivière Quoi? <laughs> <laughs> you bastards make everything sound better. Does it? Everything <laughs> sound better. Or in French? Yes. I mean, even shit sounds better in French, doesn't it? This is on oh, mer, homme de merde. Yeah. <laughs> is it homme de merde or merde de homme? No, it's uh, shit, it's merde. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying this is man shit. And, and, but what is it in French, man shit? Uh, homme de merde. Man shit, but yes. merde d'homme, I suppose. I don't merde, know. merde, merde d'homme. Merde d'homme. Did, did you know the, the word merde was, the first time it was said, was said by a guy called Vauban, which was a French general or something. Yeah. And he said it to the English. He was in the Napoleon War. Yeah. And he just, uh, he said merde to the English. He said that the first time the word was invented. Saying shit to How English. did anybody know what it meant then? I don't know, but that, that I've never been told. But that's all we were taught in school in France, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, right. Things. Okay, well, I'll sing the English version. I make it yes? 14, mi 14 and a half million tonnes. Fourteen and a half oh, million, million tons. kilos. Sorry, million kilos. Yeah, yeah so but a kilo is not. Yes, which would make it uh, one thousand and uh, one thousand five hundred tons of Chinese. Okay, well, I I reckon that twenty Chinese weigh a ton. Right. So if there's one thousand three hundred million of them, hold on. Which there allegedly are. Okay. Then that's one ton for every twenty. So if you knock off a naught, knock off a naught. That's six and a half, six point five. Oh oh, oh oh oh, oh oh, which is six. I've got six hundred and fifty million tons of them. Oh, you're probably right. It's probably because the calculator can't put in the, the naught. Six hundred and fifty million tons of Chinaman, me <laughs> Chinese. And if they all jumped off a table together, what does the word Earth weigh? Do you know? Happen to know that one, David? No, that's stupid. No, I don't know what the Earth. I believe is. there is a calculation. There is a calculation what the Earth weighs. Yes, yeah, there is, yeah. of course. Right, yeah, but I don't know off the top of my head like that. Okay, well, you've been very helpful and very useful, but um, <laughs> we need to advertise the Universal Posters Christmas oh, campaign. Oh, all these Chinese. Oh. All these Chinese, I know. Have you been to China? Not yet, it's on my list. Have you? No, it's brilliant. It is a brilliant place to go. Where have you been? Uh, a bit all over. Um, Shanghai, Beijing. Um, Beautiful. What were you doing out there? Pardon? What were you doing out there? Business and uh, business and pleasure. What's your business? Uh, I supply bits and pieces, electronic stuff, um, oh. uh, various electronic stuff. I work... Um, uh, VC, some VCRs that supply some dongles and uh, USB dongles and stuff like that. All Beautiful. that type of stuff, that stuff that's manufactured in China. But Beautiful. I, yeah, I, okay. I do quite a lot in, in fact, in, in internet radio, I, I do quite a lot. Cool. 
How about a... Moving ha- very fast, it, isn't it? Oh, yeah. God only knows. So that's, that's why I listen to play radio all the time. Don't blame you. Yeah, really. Quick burst of Colonel Bogey, the English words, then, because <laughs> I always find but this... Do you know the English words? I do. Right, you sing them. OK, I will. Uh, Fiona, are you ready? Mm-hmm. And right. Hitler has only got one ball, the other is in the Albert Hall. His mother, the dirty beggar, had it cut off when he was just four. But why would, why would it be Hitler since it's a thing to do with uh, the jab? Well, because of the urban myth that Hitler only had a, te- a single testicle, that he was monotesticular. So apparently it's been proved recently. They, they have been looking into it. No, it was, it was on the news or something. I heard it the, the other day. Uh, the, the story was it was shot off during the First World War. Yeah, but it actually had been shot off. Mm. But uh, apparently... But he, he had Parkinson's as well, didn't he? Apparently. I, uh, towards the end, he certainly had the shakes. That's quite well documented. But yeah. he was so doped up, wasn't he? According yeah. to the rise and fall of the Third Reich and all the books about Hitler. Yeah. That, 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 that may well... And he also had a lot in his mind. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh shit, my own past falling into yeah. pieces. <laughs> yeah, what happened there? <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, we think we've got problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. It's, uh... I wonder if he ever had a mortgage, Hitler. No, I, I'm sure he probably did, actually. I don't think he did. Apparently he was a very char- charismatic guy to, 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 what do you call it? Well, my, yes. My, my father was in, um, some, uh, my father was in the um, Swiss Scouts when he was a kid. Yes. And, they, you know, they do, they do exchanges in between... Um, the scouts did exchanges in between um, c- nations. And he... he when, he when he did his exchange in Switzerland, in between Germany and Switzerland, mm-hmm. he did an exchange with Hitler Youth. Really? And one of... Yeah. And one of the things that they ended up... Uh, he, one of the things that they, they laid on for him was... Um, for his... For the scouts was... Uh, a speech by Hitler. So he saw Hitler do a speech and he found himself really taken in by, taken in by it. Well, and, so were a lot of people. And three years later... And look where that ended up. And Yeah, but three years later he, he was in the RF fighting in the RF against Germany. Hmm. David, I'm very grateful for your call and for some of your calculations. Bye, um, bizarre as though they were. And if I can remember the second verse of that song about Hitler's testicle... Then, um, and we'll do it a bit later on. But thank you for your call. Nice talking to you. Nice man. 5 to 11. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. I don't know why I told you it was 5 to 11. Oh, Merry Christmas. Ah, brilliant. Thanks, Mum. I did. Great. A yak wool jumper. You really shouldn't have. You really shouldn't have. I wish she hadn't. It's the same every year. I wish she'd just go to Universal Posters. They have a fantastic range of approved pictures of some of my favourite celebrities, all digitally signed in their own handwriting. Mum could even have got one personalised just for me. Prices start from $7.99, so don't let your loved ones down this Christmas. Just go to playradiouk.com and click on the Universal Poster banner. Are you going to give me a hand out in the kitchen then? Yes, Mum. I'll help you stuff the turkey in a minute. (laughs) Yeah, with this jumper. Here she is, my sexy new MP4 player from City Dash Sales. The latest technology giving me music and video wherever I go in a range of stunning colors, all for just 60 pounds. And here are her matching speakers, gorgeous, plus picture key rings, audio visual baby monitors. Oh, she's so cute. And the baby's kind of nice too. The hottest audio visual equipment straight to your drawer. Just visit city sales.co.uk. City Dash Sales, looking good, sounding good. Great. Play to UK, the Tommy Boyd Show. Now, the second verse of the Colonel Bogey song concerns the rest of Hitler's hierarchy in the Third Reich. Okay. You haven't heard the, sto- the song about Hitler only having one testicle. I've heard the. You've heard that bit? Yes. Right. Now, who was in the Hitler uh, hierarchy? It was Himmler, wasn't there? Mm-hmm. And Goebbels. Yes. And there was another one that began with H. Now, who was that? Hitler, Himmler, Heinrich. No. Damn. 
Goebbels was his chief of staff of the Air Force, wasn't he? And Himmler, I think, was... Yeah, who was it that, um, that John Cleese, Basil Forty, was, um, talking about in Forty Towers? That was Hitler. <laughs> <Dear. laughs> no, No, but he was also talking about his sidekicks as well, wasn't he? Hit yes. No, I do know this, but the name has just gone for, for a second for me. But, um, Hitler has only got one ball, the other is in the Albert Hall, his mother. The dirty mm -hmm, had it cut off when he was just four. Goering. Hitler has only got one ball. Goering has two, but they are small. <laughs> Himmler has something similar. <laughs> but poor old Goebbels has no balls at all. Excellent. There you are. It's not bad, is it? And that's what they used to sing as they marched to their almost certain death. With a with a, a jaunty smile and their tin hat on the side of their head. But when I was God. whistling that tune, yes. I wasn't being racist. I was just you said whistle a we tune. We were trying to establish how much the Chinese nation weighs, <laughs> so that we could get some sort of a calculation on the velocity and the impact on the planet Earth and its trajectory through the cosmos of 1.3 billion Chinese who I've weighted at eight stone each, which I think is a yeah. cautious guess. Fair. Maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. cautious. But taking into account children. Yes. Um, and I've got them at 650 million tonnes they weigh. Wow. Now, can you think of anything that weighs that much? I mean, how much does the Albert Hall weigh? Oh. Because if you drop the Albert Hall from a height of three feet, that wouldn't put the earth out, would it? How much does Canary Wharf weigh? Mm. But he said the tsunami was enough to. Was, knock I think it the off earthquake that caused the tsunami yeah, is the okay. what may have. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think it might have been making stuff up, as people <laughs> can sometimes do. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so this evening we're talking Andy's headaches. Andy has two headaches ongoing at the moment. The difference in temperature between the equator and the North Pole and the South Pole, he wonders if that's merely a matter of how much further the poles are away from the sun than the equator. He says, can you imagine what would happen to planet Earth if we just moved a little bit closer to the sun mm. or a little bit further away from the sun? Yeah. But has he got his facts right there? And his other one, which is absolutely top-notch man shit, is if we had bigger tyres on our cars, mm -hmm. would we get more to the gallon? Yeah. And would it affect the reading on our speedometer? So you can Skype. It's play.radio.uk. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Uh, switchboard number 01243 Play Part of the Something Corporation. Heard a song you love? Then help us by buying your favourite chart CD through Amazon. Just click on the banner at playradiouk.com. Right then, what was the web address? Passiononline.co.uk Oh, you would look really sexy in that. Okay, that's in the shopping cart. Imagine the fun we could have with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've ordered something for you. Something for us. How about this for me? PassionOnline.co.uk has something for everybody with a fast, discreet delivery service, competitive pricing, and a free gift with every order for a limited time. See our massive product mix online right now. Click PassionOnline.co.uk, the world's sexiest online shop. Broadcasting live to the UK. News, information, entertainment, and the best music from the past 40 years. This is Play 2 UK. Tommy Boyd. Call 01243 556060. Email studio at playradiouk.com. Skype play.radio.uk. Now, live from the south coast of England, The Tommy Boyd Show, only on Play 2 UK. One of the topics that Steve Paul brought up with uh, Alison this evening between 8 and 10 that 
um, it's quite dear to my heart, is the whole business of at what age people should be allowed to drive. Yes. And it, there's a sort of a news story attached to it, isn't there? The 17-year-old who's just passed his test, even though he's been rally driving for five years, right. and rally driving on the continent, mm -hmm. because obviously you don't have to have passed your test in order to rally no. on the continent. I guess that's because it's off-road or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he took his test today and passed, which is good news for him because it means that he um, he can drive in some sort of rally in the United Kingdom in a couple of days' time. Right. Uh, so the thing is here, he's obviously been able to drive a car well since he was twelve. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't he? Allow, why, why shouldn't we allow him on the road? Well, I don't think we should allow um, young people on the road at all. I don't why not? think if they're good enough to drive a car, if they could pass the test. Why should you stop them? Because, just because they can physically drive a car, I do think there's a lot of truth in what Steve was saying about the mentality of the driver. No. And I, as much as I don't want to tar every person under the age of 25 with the same brush, um, you know, they don't, I don't believe that the majority of young men have, and I do mean men, <laughs> Um, have the the uh, maturity honestly honestly woman you know i like you but you're talking such bollocks here why am i talking bollocks well because if you pass the test it will test that and if you pass the test it doesn't test the mentality of course it does it tests no, how it you doesn't. drive yes, it tests how you drive on that particular day well that same could be said of anybody who takes the test the test is to find out whether or not you can drive. If somebody can drive, if they're aged 12 and they can drive and they take the test and they pass it, they should be allowed to drive. Where, where, where do we get off on saying, ah, oh, 17? Why 17? Why not 28 or 3 or 64? Where does that random 17 thing come from? Why 17? Do you actually wake up on your 17th birthday and feel any different? No. 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 No, absolutely. So why that arbitrary 17? Let people take the test at whatever age they want to. If somebody wants to put his six-week-old fetus into a... F for a test, they probably wouldn't pass, would they? Fair enough. But no, if you're but 12 just, and you can no, drive as well as anybody else, it's ageist. No, it's, it's discriminatory. Not. It's a form of apartheid. <laughs> it is. <laughs> really? Yes, it is, because it's an arbitrary demarcation of setting aside one group of people from another and treating them badly because you can. They haven't got the vote. It's exactly like apartheid. But you could apply that principle to anything There aren't else. any Smallville massacres going on, I know, outside the driving centre. So I recognise that there was a severity about apartheid that doesn't apply here. But the principle is exactly the same. But you could apply that principle to anything else in this society where we apply age restrictions. Well, we shouldn't. But apply re age restrictions. People don't earn the ability to do something when they have a birthday. They earn it, as we all do, by acquiring ability and wisdom through life. So we should be applying the test to people who appear to be able to pass that test. And when people go to a driving school, and almost everybody does nowadays, don't they? In fact, mm -hmm. everybody does, don't they? Yeah, of One course. of the jobs that the driving school do, reasonably well, I think, is to say, oh, I think you're about ready for your test. Okay, and if they think you're ready for your test, then you're not wasting anybody's time. And if you pass the test, you should be allowed to drive a car no matter what age you are. It happens at the other end of the age scale, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You don't go, right, at 80, I don't care how good you are, you can't drive anymore. There'd be an uproar, wouldn't there? Or, or, albeit a very sort of quiet one. I don't think people should just be able to continue to drive forever. Right, but you'd stop them driving at what age then? Uh, somewhere between 65 and 70. Vague. <laughs> I want a number. Because <laughs> it, it doesn't work down the other end of the scale. You know? And what's good for the... Is good for the... So, if we're going to say... You can't drive before you're 17. You can't get behind the wheel until midnight. On no, your 17th no, birthday. No, but I'm not saying 17. That's far too early. Right, well, whatever age, then. Okay. What age are you... 25. You, all right, 25, then. Mm -hmm. How totally arbitrary is that? But are you going to apply the same kind of guillotine... Mm hmm I said it like that because David was on earlier, speaking French... <laughs> ...at the other end of the, a, uh, of the age range. Are people at the age of, what shall we say... Okay. 82. Too old. 47. No, that's okay. 56. 
think, girl. That's okay. No, Se- I'm, 60, I'm thinking... 64. All right, 70. 70. 70. That's it, then. Give us your keys. Yes. Go on. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, why do 70-year-olds need to be able to drive... need to be able to drive a car? <sighs> I don't know. Why does anybody need to drive a car? Um, 70-year-olds, uh can't walk about as easily as 35 year olds well if they can't walk about they shouldn't be driving a car should they well the cars are driven by petrol engines not it's not like fred flintstone <laughs> 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 you little feek <laughs> that would sort out the men from the boys wouldn't it <laughs> we wouldn't have to fart around coming up with these new concepts and policy documents <laughs> would we if cars just were run by feet I'll tell you a toy that was ridiculous. Did you ever have a scooter when you were little? A scooter, yes. You know, the thing is just a platform with a wheel on either end yeah. and those rather hopeful handlebars. Yes. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that naff? Yes. Because it was actually easier to walk <laughs> than to scoot. <laughs> it was mainly girls who got scooters. Oh, hang on. It was mainly girls who got scooters. So. Scooters well, have been quite popular in the last um, few years, haven't they? Chris Eubanks made them trendy. I don't know if you've seen him around Brighton. <laughs> yeah. Really on a scooter? Oh, he's such a prat. Yes. But, oh, he is such a prat. Has he been on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here yet? Uh, we have to have him on that. I don't think so. He was I had a big G- brother, wasn't he, a few years back? GMTV rang me this morning <laughs> and said, would I come on? And I said, yeah, go on, what about? And they said, well, you know, Timmy Mallet. <laughs> so I roared with laughter. And the girl said, um, is that, is that a no? <laughs> I said, well, I said, uh, uh, can I get someone else? <laughs> so they said, well, we'll pay you. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I'd rather come on and plug play radio. She said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> I said, well, what's the money like? So they're going to send a car for me from Chichester at about four o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. to get me to the GMTV studio, I suppose, about six o'clock. Uh-huh. And then the car takes me back to Chichester. Yeah. Right. How much do you think they pay for that? <laughs> they pay. pay. I said, I is, there a, is there a fee for this? And she yeah. said, yes. Mm-hmm. I said, well, go on, what's the standard fee? Go on. Any ideas? Oh, I don't know. It's quite interesting in a sense. Okay. Okay, well, they pay you if you go on the sofa 200 quid if you're on once right 300 quid if they ask you back a second time in the morning right when they have a hole to fill (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) because sometimes somebody doesn't turn up Mm. and obviously they can't talk for three minutes about nothing yeah so one of the guests who was on at quarter past seven (laughs) gets asked back at quarter to nine which is conceivable because the audience has changed. Mm-hmm. But if you do that, then you get the 300. Right. Yes. So what, you said no. No, I didn't say no. I said, look, I'm not really that bothered about doing that sort of thing. Uh, you know, uh, it's just not me. I, I'm sitting on the GNTV sofa where you have to wear a sort of an interesting shirt. <laughs> do Talking your about ha- Timmy. <laughs> ha- have your hair done up a little bit. You know, combed. <laughs> Put a bit of base on you, mm-hmm. on your face. Yeah. And you, you sit around drinking an awful lot of coffee. Uh-huh. And then Andrew, or whoever, says to you, um, somebody who worked with, you know, you can see the yeah. introduction going up on the auto queue. One of the people who is really capturing the nation's attention on I'm a Celebrity Every Heart of Here is uh, former TVAM children's presenter Timmy Mallet. And <laughs> somebody who worked with Timmy in those golden years... Uh, joins us on the sofa now. Uh, I'd be thinking, oh, for fuck's sake, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> because, you know, he's a bit of a prat. Yes. <laughs> but you can't say prat on GMTV. <laughs> what would you say? Well, I, I was driving here this evening and I was thinking, because they said, well, well we, they said, well, well, we'll keep you, we'll keep you warm on this one. Mm-hmm. It won't be tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Which is just as well, because I've got to go to London tomorrow. Mind you, I'd be in London, wouldn't I, if I did this? But anyway, uh, they said, well, it might be Thursday or Friday. Right. I said, okay. I said, but I said, presumably, if he gets voted out, then that's that's that gone west. Yeah. And she said, well, yeah, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said, well, all right. I said, you know, keep keep me, if they ring, because I don't like saying no. I'm not very good at saying no. Are you? Not yes, you brilliant. are. Not uh, brilliant. Oh, well, right. <laughs> we'll just take a quick call. Hello there. 
You love Timmy Mallet. <laughs> This is the thing. Uh, I really don't. <laughs> and I don't know anybody who does. No. Because he's like that all the time. But that is the difficulty, isn't it? What would you say about him? Because you can't... I would say... I would say that he is ideal for television. Because he's one of those people who is magnified enormously by the television screen. And he, he suits television enormously. There's something quite effervescent but two-dimensional about him isn't there but to actually have to be in the same office as him on a day you know day by day yeah which is what a number of us were you know exposed to mm. during that time is hard work because he is always like that yeah if you've seen him on i'm a celebrity and he appears to be annoying okay well that's what he's like if all time but you see they would have asked you because they <laughs> they would know that i'd put him up against that the you <laughs> yeah. that you had to <laughs> you had that, that you, you find to. him very i annoying. said that to him <laughs> i said to him look you know what i'm gonna say i'm from felton <laughs> and i'll take it outside if you do that again i won't see what the issue was yeah but the thing was he was aware of my feelings as i as i turned round to face him on this particular occasion there was only him and me in a room and um i could see the look of fear in his face which is i didn't want to i didn't want to frighten him i just no. wanted to say in, in in clear terms you know i know you do that to other people but i really rather you didn't didn't behave like that towards me and he was fairly good for a while afterwards but he, he's incorrigible he can't help himself but be like that no. so in a sense he's perfect he's almost like a cartoon character yeah isn't he he's almost like something out of hannah barbara <laughs> Nick Fudge has emailed please consider doing the Timmy Mallet segment on GMTV and <laughs> slagging him off Tommy it will be the funniest thing ever all right well I'll take it suggestions would be vaguely all right amazing. well I'll take suggestions <laughs> I'll take suggestions what do you want me to slag Mallet off by saying cuz I mean I, I can think of two or three stories about him that are are, are, are so you know, shock, well, not shocking, but kind of gobsmacking, you know, uh, inappropriate behaviour in the office <laughs> that um, it's probably that actionable, mm. in the words of the man talking to John Gaunt. Yeah. Which is something that we will play. Let's have a chat with Michael Stark, Cabinet Member for Children's Services on Redbridge Council, who joins us now. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hi, your policy then on fostering and... This is the interview that... Um, ended his association with talk sport and i'm I, i'm hoping we're going to be able to play the whole thing and talk about the john gaunt sacking uh and the state of radio today because a friend of mine who works in radio on another radio station where they do some phone in mm -hmm. has told me that um the word has gone out that everybody has to take their foot off the gas really in the current climate really what the hell's going on mm. we won't do that what the hell is going on so thanks for that, Nick. But what do you suggest I say about the mallet? <laughs> you know, because Steve was going on earlier between 8 and 10 about telling the truth. Yes. And it's hard to tell the truth when it's your judgment. Okay. And I'd be judging him, but at least I would be telling the truth in that it is my judgment. It might not be the truth about him, but it's the truth that it is my judgment that he's a twat. What do you think... An so what odious do, little what, twat. <laughs> so, what do you think they're likely to say to you, or ask you? W what are your memories of working with Timmy? Yes. What, to what do you attribute the fact that he is, um, a, a f he is the focus of most of the attention? There was a headline in the Daily Star today, the front page of the Daily Star, <laughs> Wag Wax Timmy, and apparently off camera, mm -hmm. one of the celebrities mm -hmm. gave him a whack a slap Excellent. or a thump or mm -hmm. a kidney punch right. uh, need him in the testicle i don't oh, know a bit harsh mm -hmm. not really <laughs> fair <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so the, one of the questions would be you know what would, what do you attribute the fact that he is mm. attracting so much attention and i think what the question they're really asking is is he really like that or is it an act and, yes and, and that's what the man is like yes there are two or three people on television who are actually like that mm. um Who's the guy who does the antiques thing with the ble uh, the red face? Cheapest chips. Dickinson. Uh, David Dickinson, yes. Yeah. 
Well, let's take a look, shall we? And find out exactly how much the ashtray fetched. <laughs> All that shit. He's like that. He's a... Well, yeah, uh, yeah. And John McCrick, who actually I quite like, <laughs> he is like that. Yeah. And Timmy Mallet is like that. Mm. I mean, and that's so what... So at least Timmy that... Mallet's being honest. He's not putting on an act. He's being true to him. Email from Anne. Says, hello, I'm with Fiona on this one, Tommy. It's a medical fact that a young person's brain is not fully matured and connected up completely until they're in their early 20s. Judgment can be impaired. Yes, they can pass their test, but all of their driving has mm. been... In a controlled environment up to that point. <clears throat> they go out on the roads, Anne. I don't want to cross swords with Anne. She's one of the great contributors and whose wisdom... But I think you're missing the point. Um, what is the point? The point is, is that they might be able to physically drive the car, but they might not have the maturity to to drive the car at all times sensibly. So if they've got friends in the car or, um, I don't know, they want to be showing off to girlfriends. This is very awkward for me. I only have one qualification, <laughs> and that is in the theory of child development. <laughs> <laughs> so just tell me again <laughs> your theory, what you've got. <laughs> what bit didn't you understand? Uh, what bit didn't I understand? Well, uh, have you heard of Jean Piaget? Yes. Okay. Piaget's stages of development? Yes. Yes? Yes. Which are concluded at the age of? Uh, uh, Fourteen. Fourteen. Bingo. <laughs> yes, no, says that. No, yeah. No, well, no, no, all right, no, go no. argue with Piaget then. <laughs> well, <laughs> Only it was, it was on the work of Jean-Paul Piaget. Yeah, but, that that didn't, but Piaget wasn't considering uh, driving a motor car. No, Piaget was, was considering intellectual development. Yes. And you drive with your intellect? <sighs> God. Sorry, is that, a, is that one nil? Do you want to see no! it again in slow motion? No, I don't want to see hey, it in slow motion. Hey, let's look at it from another angle. See who got the final touch. <laughs> I did. No. Not bullying, just winning. No, I'm a on this one. Anne continues. What we're talking about here is... Why do people have to wait until they're 17 to pass a test? If you can take your test and pass your test, if you go to your test, if you get a driving school's recommendation that you're ready to pass your test at the age of 12, 15, whatever, and you take your test and you pass your test, then you should be allowed to drive. You get 11-year-olds going to Oxford? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking yeah, about we are. driving We're talking a dangerous, about the fact that some people mature earlier. Piece of some equipment. people mature earlier than others. I know they do. Right, some people I are realize that. just as clever as any of us. I realise that. The will trouble ever be is, the, the majority of, of young of young men yeah. are not mature enough. Plenty of people to fail act sensibly yeah, they fail, on the road. Fail their test because been they're not too good enough. Many yeah. young men have, have been killed on the roads within days of passing their driving test. Well, obviously, too many have, but how many? Well, I haven't got all the facts. You haven't got any of the facts? Yes, I have. You haven't got one fact? I... <laughs> Bing, <go. laughs> I was arguing with the bloke on the golf course on Friday. He was lecturing me about how Gordon Brown screwed up the com country. Mm -hmm. And what you do if you're trained samurai... <laughs> don't laugh at me. Oh, no. I'm the only trained oh, samurai you'll ever meet. This poor guy. Go well, on. No, and what you do is when you meet a person, right, mm -hmm. whose arguments are frantic, as the samurai put it, what you must do is listen carefully to what they have to say and sympathetically. Mm -hmm. And then gradually ask them to provide the logic for their viewpoint, you mm -hmm. see. And this is what I did with him because he was going on and on about how the country's screwed. And the country is not screwed. And he was saying that we're worse placed than any other country in Europe. And we owe more than anybody else in the world. And I said, oh, how much is that? And he went, lots. I said, yes, but how much? He went, oh, trillions. I said, do you know how many trillions? And he went, no. And there was a silence and he just went, you're shot. You see? 
you've got to have your facts. Yeah, I understand. You're I really? realise that. You've got any? Oh, I can get some. I bet you more accidents are caught. I can get some. I can get some facts. I will do. Go ahead and get some. I will do. And You're I talking would not make just bilge. <laughs> <laughs> make just sweepy statements you are. like your friend on the golf course well you are no i'm not y you said i'm not because every time i hear that someone's killed themselves on the road and it was the day that they passed the driving test or a few days within passing their driving test and mm. you were talking about a 17 year old lad it just i just think that's awful why are we allowing these you know because it, there is this there are even you know, one person going and doing it is too many, but there have been lots of these kind of incidences. And yes, I will get you the facts if you want the facts. And Do so. I hold my hand up, say I have not got them right now. Do so. But but the facts are there, and I will get them. Do so. I, we what will continue I don't, this. What I don't like is the discrimination that happens against people who don't have the vote. Mm -hmm. And this applies to almost every way in which we treat young people in this country. And I think that in a hundred years' time, we'll come to we'll we'll look back on what we people will look back on what we were doing, uh, and they will say, why didn't they listen to the voices of the children? Why didn't they give children the same rights that they give everybody else? But the thing because is, Tommy, it's also <laughs> it's such an old-fashioned idea that 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 we know so much and they don't know very much at all. Uh, we don't know very much. But it's because I care about young people that I don't want them to be going... I don't want my son mm. turning 17 and, you know, he, so he's able right, to so now go out... Now get into the heart go on. Really? What? Get the heart no, we're not getting to the heart of anything. waiting for you to get there. But you, to, to what say What you're doing that is you're forming a whole argument that you want <sighs> to affect every single youngster in the United Kingdom. And this policy okay that the grit of sand that has caused the pearl of this policy is your worry about your own son well th i'm sure i'm sure that's at the root of but, it somewhere uh, you, you should have known that before you voiced this policy and made that the headline of your policy i love my son i want him to live forever i certainly don't want him to die in a car crash so i don't want him to take his test at 12 pass it and be driving around the streets of Brighton at two o'clock in the morning, pissed. Which, of course, is not going to happen, but being a normal mother, you mm -hmm. no doubt have constructed those worst-case scenarios in your mind, because all mothers do, all the time. The seven-year-old says, can I go to the shops? He's never been to the shops by himself before. You realise that he is now old enough, because he doesn't have to cross the road, to go to the one-stop and buy a bar of chocolate, and this becomes the most terrifying three minutes of your life. When you watch your child go down the front gate by himself, go through the gate, turn left and out of your sight, mm -hmm. and you're going, juggernaut, juggernaut, paedophile, paedophile, juggernaut, paedophile, paedophile, driving a juggernaut, naturally is heading at 80 miles an hour towards my son my son what am i going to do and you pace the room up and down and you imagine all the most terrible things happening to your son this is all natural behavior mm -hmm. and he comes back and you're fine mm -hmm. until the next time he goes mm -hmm. out for the first time on his bike the first time he stays overnight somewhere the first time he goes to play football in the park and he's due back at half past four and it's 20 to five and he's not come back okay these fears are Mm -hmm. valuable mm -hmm. but you can't convert them into a, into a policy that you want to impose I'm not on to the rest of the them. nation i'm not attempting to convert them but it does make me so cross the amount of young people that are killed on the roads our number is oh one two four three fifty five sixty sixty our email address is studio at playradiouk.com our Skype address is play.radio.uk. Placing UK weather. Clear and chilly over England and Wales with light winds and some air frost, especially in the south. Cloud in the north will spread south overnight, bringing milder conditions generally, but also some outbreaks of light rain over western areas. Looking on to tomorrow, largely dry with occasional white bright spells over southern and eastern parts of the UK. Cloudy with outbreaks of light rain and drizzle elsewhere. Mild in the north, but rather windy. You're up to date on Play 2 UK. PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation.
In 1764, Henry J. Podcast invented the bestest way of catching up on all the show loveliness you couldn't be bothered to catch live. The podcast, as it is now known, has since become popular with royalty, inmates, and the occasional zoo animal. If you have missed any of our audio transmissions, such as Tommy Boy, Mike Mendoza, or the Sunday Roast, then fear not, brave radio warrior. Just go to playradiouk.com forward slash podcast and download them for free in your own time and then put them on your computer or MP3 player. Consider yourself a lucky listener and download the tremendous podcasters now. Playradiouk.com forward slash podcast. Making the unmissable catch up Salon Supplies is one of the leading professional hair and beauty suppliers in the UK. We service thousands of salons and offer a unique personal service through our dedicated sales consultants who visit salons daily. Our cash and carries are located in Southampton, Gloucester, Sussex, Exeter, Cornwall, Milton Keynes and Northampton. For more information, call our head office now on 02380 227722. Tommy Boyd on Play 2 UK, the original cunning linguist. Beautiful. Now, <clears throat> two things. First of all, some very intelligent emails have come in on this issue, which we will then get to. But perhaps most important of all, earlier this evening, Fiona, Steve compared you to a moose. Charming. <laughs> <laughs> and I happen to have in our library of archived sound effects a moose. That didn't sound particularly moose-like to me did it it, did, it actually uh, sounded like something with a bad cough here's a drive by harley davidson shooting there you go. okay that would, would have underpinned <laughs> number of recent news stories with that in the worst possible taste <laughs> uh, and just quickly here's a martian voice Mm, very poor. <laughs> okay, uh, to the emails then. Nicholas Fudge has emailed back in connection with the things that I should say on the GMTV sofa about Timmy Mallet when they ask. He says, Tell everyone about the Wally he really is. That he's a child in a grown up's body and irritating to adults and incapable of intelligent conversation. Tell them he can't be reasoned with or toned down, and that leads to him rubbing people up behind the scenes. And you can add that it's bad for a working relationship, but great TV for ratings. They're jungle cages on I'm a Celeb, and for that reason he deserves to stay in. So sort of mixed views there. <laughs> uh, uh, David has sent a, a link to a site about um, the Earth's tilt on the atmosphere. I, I can't do links. It would be a good idea if you went to the link yourself and then just precede the information there. That would make a good email. Why can't List you do links? What? Why can't you do links? All right, I'll read the link out. There. Here we go. <laughs> go on, I'll show you why I don't do a link, all right? <coughs> David emails. About the axis after the earthquake. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www dot plate electronics dot com slash article asp does that answer your question why can't you just click on the link well because then you go to a website where you then have to browse with your eyes and your mind right, to okay. digest the information and then All right, be point a taken oh jeez <laughs> Right, so this is Mr. Mouse has emailed on the... In answer to your question, it gets colder as you go north or south. We're asking the question, Andy's headache today, is, is the North Pole colder than the equator just because it's a bit further away from the sun? And Mr. Mouse has emailed, it gets cold as you go north or south because of the angle that the light hits the Earth. One, the Earth is tilted on its axis in relation to the way it rotates the Earth. This is why we get seasons. I can't quite get that. If it's tilted, and it's presumably spinning through this slightly tilted axis, I mean, why is that? Are all the other planets like that? Are we out a bit? <laughs> I think, well, we obviously are, yeah. This is why we get seasons, he says. Number two, when the light hits the equator, it does so at right angles to the Earth. 
Yeah, but you still get the sun overhead, almost overhead in the winter, don't you? I mean, not dead overhead, but quite high. Mm. Or is it low throughout the winter? I know that men look better in low sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. It's very low sunlight today. And that's why I'm so good looking today. (laughs) Yes, Tommy. Three. When the light has a more northerly location, it hits the location at an angle. Yep. The energy from a square metre of sun will therefore be more spread out as you go more north. Yeah. I can see that. That's well explained. Therefore, if the Earth was closer to the sun, this would not have too much effect. If Mars had an atmosphere, it would not be significantly different to Earth. Sincerely yours. And Paul has emailed, just wanted to share this, hope I'm not imposing. Tonight, sadly, I took one of those phone calls. A good friend and drinking buddy of mine died this evening. He was 40. His wife had been to pick up their son from Cubs and came home to find him dead on the kitchen floor. We presume he had a heart attack. Their children are the same ages as my two youngest and are in the same classes at school. I only spoke with him yesterday as we were both doing the school run. It'll be his son's eighth birthday tomorrow. I cried and I do now and as I will no doubt tomorrow when I have to explain what has happened to my young ones. His name was Rob and he was just a really nice bloke. Cheers for your time, Paul. I'm just emailing back. You are right there? Hmm. do 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 There's nothing you can say, is there? You notice that? Hmm. Not really. Nothing you can say. I don't know what to do. I'm going to do something, though, because I don't know what. I think it doesn't do any of us any harm to occasionally rehearse what we might say when we get to the top of the steps and turn to face the other mourners when someone we know and love is in that box there Mm. because we take so many of our family friends and acquaintances as being somehow immortal Mm-hmm. And of course, it's the biggest lie we tell ourselves yeah. quietly, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. the only way of dealing with death. It's not there. Everything's permanent. Yeah. Just on odd occasions. On odd occasions. I start saying what I would say if it was my wife in the box. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing to do. You think? Yeah. Just occasionally, not often. Mm-mm. Just occasionally. Makes you really appreciate uh, what you've got in other people. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to, to do. I think the best thing I can do is play something completely ridiculous. Uh, like a western theme. West. I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? But life is ridiculous.
I've emailed him back. Shall okay. I tell you what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'll think about you tomorrow when you do this, which I know you will do magnificently. I had to tell my sons that their granddad had died. It was only a week after he'd looked after them for a weekend. Mm-hmm. Mm. I got the phone call. Mm-hmm. He was a baker. Well, he was the son of a baker. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that I was having a go at making bread. My sons yeah. were very small and they were pottering around. Yeah. You know, it's, it's quite a good thing you do. Mm-hmm. Took a phone call. I had dough all over my hands. Mm. My mum was distraught on the phone. Mm. He keeled over mowing the lawn. And I knew that my boys knew something was up because obviously I had to centre with my mum on the phone. Mm. And you know like when you're little and you, somebody's on the phone and you can hear that something's not quite right? Yeah. So I put the phone down and I... Oh. Mm. So I took them into the front room and sat them down either side of me. My wife was out shopping. Mm-hmm. It was a Saturday lunchtime. England would use to play Malta in a meaningless, friendly. It's funny what you remember, isn't it? Yeah. We won it one nil. It's funny what you remember. Mm. I put my arms around them both and said, "I've got some very bad news. Dear old Manny has died. They called him Manny because mm-hmm. he was a man. Yeah. When they were little, they went, man." And then that turned into Manny. Mm-hmm. People in Brighton thought I was Jewish because my dad was called Manny. <laughs> <laughs> did. <laughs> anyway. And then we just sat there for a moment and didn't know what to say. Mm. Now, to, 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 on, a, on, a, on a slightly smaller scale, I suppose, that's what Paul's got to do tomorrow. Yeah. Have you talked to your children about death? Um, I've had conversations with my daughter because she's now eight. And she's aware that um, a year ago, in a couple of weeks' time, um, I lost my gran. And so I made the decision um, to take her with me to the funeral because I thought it would be a good opportunity to gently, you know, because it wasn't somebody that she was really, really close to. Although she knew and loved, it wasn't somebody that... You know, it would just be very gently introduction to, you know. Um, but it's it's the whole innocence of it, isn't it, with children? Because, you see, I remember I was having this conversation with her about... Um, I, I, I think I explained about how she had gone to heaven, yeah. And I was able to kind of relate that back um, to when um, we'd lost a cat... And the cat had gone to heaven and, you know, just tried to make it nice and this kind of thing. But, of course, when I took her along to the funeral, um, I thought that I ought to explain, before we went along to the church, I thought I ought to explain um, what was going to be happening, just to kind of prepare her and that there'd be the box um, and that I was explaining that my gran was in the box. And, of course, she turned around and said to me, so, Mummy, how does she get from the heaven into the box? Yes. And I thought, no, this is the trouble, isn't it? You yes. tell your children yes. things because you want to kind of put it to them gently and in a nice way. But if you don't tell them the truth, mm. then, you know. Heaven helps, though. The concept mm. of heaven helps. Do you believe in it? Um, I believe in something. I don't know what. I don't know that I believe it in the kind of religious sense It's a good thing, no, but it's a great... It's right up there with Father Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. And... Anyway, good luck to Paul. My little boy, Mm. um, when recently when we lost another cat, my little boy said to me, looking in the sky one day, Mummy, do you have to go take an aeroplane to go to heaven? Yeah, but it helps. Yeah. It helps. Right, park that one there. Because you don't want to... You should think about death a little. Mm-hmm. But not a lot. No. Not a lot. 
PlayRadioUK.com, part of the Something Corporation. Get PlayRadio at your fingertips by downloading our exclusive toolbar. Get the latest updates from PlayRadio UK. Check out the webcams or find out your local weather. It's even got its very own search engine. Download the toolbar now by clicking on the banner at PlayRadioUK.com. With Christmas well and truly upon us, you may be thinking about digging out your old festive CDs. The thing with Christmas compilations is they get thrown in some box somewhere. By the time it comes around again, you've forgotten where you put them and have to go out and buy some more. Well, we have the solution. Just follow these three easy steps to seasonal satisfaction. One, switch on your computer. Two, go to playradiouk.com. And three, click on Play Christmas. Play Christmas UK. So good, it's Santa's favourite station. Want to see Wonder Bra star Katie Green, Lee Francis, the man behind Avid Merrion and Keith Lemon, Sunday League Madness, Jimmy Carr, 2009's Best Games Reviewed, and brand new Jennifer Ellison picks. For the fittest women, the biggest celebs, and the loudest laughs, get loaded. New issue on sale now. Tommy Boyd on Play 2 UK, a super song of sanctity in a weird and wacky world. So, David Porter. Good evening, David Porter. Ah, Vancouver. Uh, does that mean... R, his email is signed R apost- uh, asterisk Vancouver. It's a star. Is that a star? It is. What's the difference between a star and an asterisk? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> no, it's because if you look just to the right, yeah. rockstarvancouver.com. Okay. He says, when I was at school, I just wasn't sure whether to give it a kind of a Canadian accent, which I'm not particularly good at. Then don't. I will, in case he's Canadian. No, he's not Canadian, because he talks about quid. So, when I was at school, I had some friends who passed the driving test at 17. Back then, a 17-year-old could sit with another 17-year-old who hadn't passed the test. They were idiots. They'd buy a car for 50 to 100 quid, do it up, race it, trash it, mess around in it, basically run it to the ground and then buy another cheap car. They lived in villages so they could race them around the lanes. They acted like 17-year-olds, dangerous, idiotic. I'm not saying all 17-year-olds act like that, but I can tell you the reason they did is that they were 17. It's a good thing the law was changed so a newly passed driver who was 17 couldn't sit with another 17-year-old who had passed the test. Who hadn't passed the test. Hadn't passed the test. There's no way 17-year-olds act the same way as older drivers. Then if that's the case, that's a clear failing of the test. Mm -hmm. Not of the notion that there are 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds... 12 year olds who can drive as well as anybody else that's a fact the other fact is that the test is clearly fallible because it fails to fail people who go on to behave in that way i agree there's the problem not the fact that at the age of 17 on the morning of your 17th birthday you're suddenly a different person that is sheer bollocks Mm -hmm. isn't it it is and yet it is the crux of your argument is it not? It no. is central to your case. No, it's not. That maturity is 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 a, a univ- happens at a universal trajectory. No, I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. Look, I know you're tired. You got a cold. You couldn't beat me in an <laughs> Don't argument. Make excuse. You couldn't beat me in an argument. No, if, I know. If you went into training for three weeks, I agree. There you are. No, yeah, of course you do. In the end, no. <laughs> took me a while though, didn't it? Really? I wonder if there is some kind of boot camp you could go to to get you into shape for an argument with uh, with a man. You find it, I'll do it. Would you go to argument boot camp? Yeah. That would be a good show, wouldn't it? Yeah. That would be a really good show. <laughs> you could get eight members of the public and four celebrities, and they're all wimps. <laughs> that weatherman on BBC One, he'd be all right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no. He's the, yes, you do. Mm-hmm. do he, I? Okay. he looks very wimpy. Right. Uh, who else is a bit of a wimp? Um... The guy who does the sport on BBC Breakfast. He right. seems a bit wimpy to me. Mm. Who else? It's all television. I don't watch that much television. Justin Webb, the BBC's American correspondent. Right. Justin Webb. He he's 
<laughs> he, he'd be good at argument boot camp. <laughs> be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'd have to toughen you up and <laughs> get you fit. Yeah, still wouldn't win an argument with you, though. Well, I don't. I don't always win arguments, but I never lose. My dad taught me that. Now yeah, he's in my mind, you see, my dad, because mm -hmm. we talked about his death mm -hmm. in my mind a lot. Taught me a few things like that. It was Geordie, big guy, huge he was. Biggest head you've ever seen. Really? The only head I've ever seen that was bigger. Two people, Mussolini, <laughs> who had a massive head. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the size of, of a milk bucket. It was huge, his head, and his neck just went straight down. He had no, in other words, he, his neck didn't taper in. No. It just went straight down mm -hmm. into his shoulders. And yeah. my dad was the same. When he married my mum, mm -hmm. his neck measurement was greater than my mum's waist measurement. Oh, my goodness. I know. He was a bodybuilder, one of the first. He was a very good boxer and weightlifter. Mm. He was a steel worker in the steel mills of... Um, Cleveland in Middlesbrough. Mm -hmm. Huge bastard he was. <laughs> he grew into a very lovely gentle man, although he was quite bombastic yeah. when he was younger. How tall was he? He wasn't huge, about 5'10", but he was mm. about three feet wide. Right. Um, and uh, and he was really sort of huge. I'll show you a picture sometimes. He's got a massive face. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're very small and your dad is like that, yeah. you know, there were times when he needed to be much more gentle. Mm. around the house he had a huge booming voice you could hear him coming down the road if he was muttering to himself <laughs> i'm not joking it was a <laughs> oh, God, i know <laughs> Boy, and it came from sort of his boots <laughs> um anyway <laughs> let's uh let's mop up the emails it's mm -hmm. 10 to 12 tamsin says i'm really not sure about this young people driving thing i've given my 14 year old a go on the drive up to the house we're still paying for new fencing and have replaced the car now. And there is my mother at the other end. Darling, I drive with the full beam on now. <laughs> you do get that. I didn't misunderstand the junction, but I do think cats should stay at home. <laughs> These are quotations from Tamsin's mother. I know you don't do traffic news, but stay off the streets of Epsom between 10 and 12 a.m. She goes up to the supermarket then. <laughs> then she says, oh dear, I've just heard Paul's email life it's just that until suddenly it's not it's just that until suddenly it's not mm. yes it didn't hit me but my father had died until the following morning it doesn't i went home and he was still lying in the garden mm -hmm. with a rather unfortunately tatty blanket which they got from the garage mm -hmm. the ambulance people to put mm -hmm. over him when they said he's dead Anyway, the following m I went home and drank about three quarters of a bottle of whiskey mm -hmm. in the very top of the house. Yeah. Cried a lot, as you do. But the following morning, I decided to go for a run. And it was funny, both my brothers, independently, we all went for a run. Yeah. And as I was doing up my trainers on the drive, I thought how privileged I was to be able to feel the laces between my fingers. Mm. Because he'd never be able to do that again yeah and yet never in my life had i thought something as simple as just being able to hold laces in my fingers and do a knot was anything special mm -hmm. i mean sadly that intense awareness of all the sensations that you experience second by second that we take for granted that are worth celebrating just being able to lick your lips mm -hmm. be able to blink when you want to mm -hmm. be able to scratch your face when you want to fantastic things mm. but but sadly then life comes along and you get bound up in all your problems and you forget about those little things mm. thanks tamsin for your kind thoughts if you're still listening then might be just nice to know that somebody else has thought about you isn't it nice to know that somebody thinks about you yeah and this from um a good old happy tree children driving and meritocracy he says i've had arguments in the past from challenged thinkers who support limiting employment opportunities for blacks because they apparently have less brain power and women because they apparently are too weak or flighty to survive in a business environment now you see this person is talking my language <laughs> mm -hmm. first of all we disenfranchised blacks then we disenfranchised women 
and then we've always disenfranchised children. But the blacks have been emancipated, you've got the vote, but children are still, still treated as being second-class citizens. Go on. He says, quite apart from the distastefulness of this attitude, one only needs to hang one's hat on sheer merit and discard pre-selection according to a generalised set of criteria that are far from being conclusive. This man talks my language only better than what I do. <laughs> he says, simply, if anyone has the merit to do anything, then let them try. Either they pass, which proves they're able, or they fail on their own efforts. Exactly my point. Just perfect it's, it's fair meritocracy is such an automatic and simple selection process and we have no need to entertain anyone's prejudices that's right it's a huge believer in this however i do find myself partially agreeing with fiona uh, he fancies you mm -hmm. <laughs> since it is true that younger drivers are involved in the majority of dangerous crashes. I presume it is for no reason that insurance... It is not for no reason that insurance premiums for new drivers are more expensive. But then to what extent is that due to pure road experience and not really an indication of any lack of maturity or seriousness in driving a car? Maybe one factor is that the more one is aware of the precarious position you are sitting in a metal cage with a lot of momentum, the more likely you are to take care. So it's about awareness rather than age. I don't know which side to come down on, he finishes, on this one. I do admit to having an instinctive feeling that younger drivers will naturally be more reckless, but since I can argue myself out of that opinion, I'm going to go away and think about it a bit longer. Ah, magnificent. I stand by what I say. Nothing I've heard is, will make me change my mind. Why? Why? Supposing you find out that there's no such thing as, uh, as a child. And this in, supposing you find out that there's no such thing as children, in fact that everything that's going on around you is a complete fiction and you are an exhibit in an alien zoo <laughs> who is having this entire fictional world sprayed into your brain in order to make you act as though it's all going on. Supposing you found that out, well, then I'd just sit would back that and change enjoy your it. mind? Well, I wouldn't care. But we thinkers can't be doing with this idea that you'll never change your mind no matter what you hear. Bertrand Russell said you should no, always... No, nothing tonight, nothing I've heard tonight has made me change my mind. Mm. You know, no. when I was, when I was a, in my teens, there were four guys that I knew that went out in a BMW one day and just they were out messing around and all four of them were killed outright and i in the, what, in the one car in one car yeah because they were just out there you know having what they thought was fun they weren't you know the total disrespect or lack of respect for the fact that they were driving a dangerous piece of machinery mm -hmm. they hit a tree and all four of them were killed they passed outright. the test had the driver passed a test? The driver had, yeah. yeah. Well, there's something wrong with the test, then. This is my point. Simple as that. But this has happened so many times. You, but again, we... we yeah. Hello. Hang on. Look. Hello. Just, look, I don't know what you rang up about. I rang up about Enrico Morricone. I think it's wholly inappropriate. What's happened now? What's the latest? Well, it's still inappropriate. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, but I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, in, uh, 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 that music you were playing, uh, what you call uh, clean T-shirt, it's wholly inappropriate. Wholly inappropriate. I couldn't agree with you. Wholly. It's it's inappropriate at the workplace. Uh, no, it's inappropriate anywhere. Not anywhere. Enrico Monacone is inappropriate at any time of the day, except uh, in the past when uh, it was appropriate. And well, you that, should know. Uh, that? What about in the privacy of his own home? He has done some good one once upon a time in the West. What was that one you was playing, Sam? Oh! That was one I can't th whistle any longer. I have no front teeth. However, I am overcoming uh, my drawbacks and I am developing another technique. So don't put any whistling tunes yet. How about Ghost Riders in the Sky? Ghost Riders in the Sky, Phil. How does that go? We like playing you. Oh, this is Ghost Riders in the Sky. It is, isn't it? Oh, hey! hey. Uh, like 
magnifique guy. Let's try this one. What's this one? What's this one? This is inappropriate. What's this one? I'll tell you what, I'll pay for my broadband and I am going to ask for my year can Yes, I'm going to step pay if they're going to fucking put this zoomer into me blacked up. That's the fish full of dollars. That's why it's a Bertolucci movie and it's considered a classic homage Bertolucci. to Bertolucci. Uh, yeah. Hello. And it's considered... But yes, but I haven't got time to talk about that, sir. It's, it's cl- 12 o'clock. It's a classic... <laughs> It's a classic homage to Kurosawa's Right. You won't be in two next week. Now, that's well, not at least. Yeah, a bit of country and western. No, this is the man who shot Liberty Valance. Oh, of course, the man who shot Liberty Valance. Have you ever noticed that Henry Fonda's voice sounds slightly like uh, Jack Nicholson? Tumblr. Hang on, what's this? I can't hear the words, Phil. This is the Streets of Laredo. Go for it. You know the words to this one. Streets of Laredo? I don't. I know Birmingham Jail. I can't hear the words. This is not a superior handset this week. Anyway, I think you should come in on uh, Friday. Okay. Ta-da. Ta-da. This is... Do you know this one, Fiona? See? Me, oh my darling. (laughs) Hello? Hi, Tommy. Yeah, who's this? Yes, Pete from Coventry. So I want to say thanks for a great show again. Oh, you're very kind. I, I think we just about got away with it again. Yeah, I yeah. really enjoyed it. It's fantastic. Oh, th- thanks, mate. I appreciate that. And uh, when, you, when are you on next, Don? Next Monday. Okay, I'll be listening after that. It's fantastic. I'm grateful for your call. You're a nice man. What are you? I'm a very nice man, and you're a very nice man too. Okay, Tony good. Thank Tony you. Hancock says. As Tony Hancock says, yes. <laughs> what a nice man. He's nicked my wine gums. Take care. Bye bye. That's from the blood donor. It's from the blood donor, Fiona. You don't care, do you? No. You don't bother about it. It's man <laughs> shit, that is. <laughs> If the, the Tony Hancock classic there. episode is the blood donor. I know. And after he's given his pint of blood, he sits on a bed and he has mm-hmm. tea and biscuits. He does. And he has a conversation with Hugh Laurie. No, Hugh Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> Griff Reese Jones. What, what's all that about then, mate, eh? What? Uh, Isn't could that sh- the only reason he went for the blood donor? Okay. For the tea and biscuits? No, he wants a badge. <laughs> right. He said, you do get a badge, don't you? You do get a badge. <laughs> and the woman said, no. He said, oh. He said, I've got, I, I'm a great collector of badges. He said, I never walk past somebody who's rattling a tin. And he's got a great line. He goes, the lapels are always the first things to go on my suits. 